but I thought it started with Into Darkness. Oh, I brought this oh, last year, and I don't think I got to show it. I think I had to speed through it real fast. So if you want to see that, I'll kind of show you the process to how that movie went. And uh, did you guys see the movie? Oh, yeah. Did you hate it, love it, or <laughs> wish to do yeah, another one? Or? Okay. <laughs> but well, no, it was it uh, we, uh, a different grade. Yeah. Well, it was a very interesting process. It was another JJ movie, and they were actually hiring more Star Trek cast. The first one they didn't hire anyone. There was a rule of, uh, that they couldn't hire a Star Trek cast. And I only got on the first one because they fired three guys, and I had interviewed with the designer on Mission Impossible. And so he brought me in. He goes, if you can work on our movie, they'll be an influence what you did before. We'll bring you on. So it worked out, and I got to go to the second one. But um, the second one, we didn't get a script. We didn't get to read a script. We had a, an art director for every department in the in the movie. So we had prop art director, uh, the spaceship <coughs> art director, the set art director. So everyone had their own boss, and we couldn't talk amongst ourselves about the movie. So one of the directors would always go with us to lunch. So so we wouldn't talk. But the whole script was under code. And so my boss would come in and go, well, we just read the script, and we need you to work on the garbage truck, the uh, ventilation system, the fire alarm, and the buzz saw. <laughs> what are you talking about? Oh, these are codes. Uh, garbage truck is the, the phaser right. I go, oh, okay. And so the, I go, which one? A good guy, bad guy, Starfleet? What is it? And he goes, well, I can't tell you that, but just start drawing some phaser rifles. So I start drawing phaser rifles, and, and they go, oh, no, these need to be dark because oh, the garbage truck is bad. So, and it, it just went, it was that way the entire movie. And, uh, and then come in, and I, I started drawing stuff for a character named April. Which we didn't know until the movie came out that it was Khan. But, uh, and so it was just all this crazy stuff. So it was a very, very interesting show. But uh, I'll start showing the slides and I'll, I'll talk through them. So. He's going to come help me out. Yeah. And there's the, uh, there's the poster. Yeah. How did the designer, the people that draw a rifle that have nothing to reference it from? The good guy, bad guy? With that, with that first garbage truck. Thing that came in, when I, I drew just a bunch of designs, and I go, what color scheme do you want it to go into? And uh, they said, make it dark. So I assumed it was going to be a bad guy's thing. And over time, they loosened up a little bit. They didn't, they didn't break that code. And uh, I think they all went bugged, so, uh, so the boss would know. Because it was very interesting with Sony Pictures. I don't know how they did it, but uh, when they started the filming process, um, they, uh, certain days we couldn't go to the set. They would put tarps up between the and stuff. I just needed an alien for a stand-in for the prop. And uh, I was pretty much the props on this show. I didn't, didn't do many spaceships on this one, but um, they're going, come up with anything that's native but looks alien, and there's not a lot of stuff that hasn't been done, like there's blow guns and harpoon guns and all that stuff. But we came up with this thing, and it's a stick that the guy runs with, and he can catch a rock and kind of throw it at you as he's running. And so that was the kind of the concept behind that. And we can go into the next one. You want me to forward those or? No, I'm good. You're good. And so then we had to do a spear, and I was trying to think of something that would kind of architecturally tie all the aliens together. So the first thing I, I tried was this little string on the back with a feather hanging off of it. And uh, so they kind of like that one, and that kind of progresses as the drawings go. And so uh, I still do all the blue line pencil work first, and my boss actually likes that because he can see stuff right away without doing a big greedy model. And uh, we can go to the next one. And uh, this is, a, they wanted a, a dart gun. And I was a big fan of that Road Warrior movie and that guy with the crossbow on his wrist. So that's kind of where that idea came, idea came from. And we kind of did like a little stretched, stretched uh, kind of elastic thing that would shoot these itty bitty darts. And uh, you see the six or seven strings down there that do the taper. That was kind of the architecture we designed for this alien race, that that was their signature, their signature <coughs> sign. And he's got a whole course of lines and darts on there. And we'll go to the next one. And kind of here was the overall alien prop world here. So you got rocks, everything had that, that tie-in string on it. So it was kind of fun to do. And then they decided they wanted to go with some blow guns. And I think they'll have me with that in the next, uh, the next drawing. So again, it's just uh, hand-drawn stuff. And I'll just throw it in the computer and scan it, do some coloring. And here's some blow guns that we we're coming up with. And we started doing research on these uh, tribes that do the blow guns. And you, you'll see like a, say an American guy trying to do a blow gun. And they're, they're holding it like this. But the pictures of the alien, or the uh, actual people that use them, they hold it really tight with both hands at their mouth. And they're so accurate that I, I couldn't even hold it with them, moving all around. So these guys really got some 
incredible uh, targeting skills. I think I get a picture coming up of one of these gentlemen. Yeah, there he is down at the bottom. And so he just holds this this huge tube that's longer than he is, right at right at the base there. But uh, we came up with things like there might be a giant crustacean animal that they made a blowgun out of that was number one, and they just went went through a whole variety of stuff. And we can move on to the next one. And these were saddles for the uh, for the creatures. And uh, my daughters are all rodeo girls, so we had saddles everywhere. So the uh, they made me do the straps right. And uh, we can move on to the next one. Oh, okay, I'll finish with the island talk. Right? We're moving on to the next one. But uh, as you know, in the movie, it, it, they didn't have the budget to do what they wanted to do. There was a big volcano, and all kinds of stuff they're going to build uh, set-wise. And it wound up that that scene kind of diminished in the script. And so we went down to just the chase, the jump off, and then the saving of the volcano. And uh, so about this big, probably third of the movie story turned into, I think, maybe 10 minutes on the screen. And so it just established that they break rules was basically the moral of the story on it, that Kirk would get in trouble for it. And so this was kind of a merchandising thing where we had a new prop master on the show, and he goes, well, they want to do new things in case we do new toys. So he goes, the other ones didn't do too good. So we need to do new communicators that are based on the old one, but we'll have a new look. So in case that's the one make new toys. So it's always kind of funny when you have to draw around a, a kind of a toy constraint. And uh, Star Trek is always kind of that way. And so here were the three versions here. And uh, I believe they went with the bottom the bottom one with the symbol in the center. I don't think you see it too much other than that. And we move on to the next one, and I think I have a picture. Yeah, and you can see it right there with the little symbol in the center. And this actor is so crazy. He's like high strung all the time. A lot of fun. And we go to the next one. And this tool here was my boss's favorite. He picks he picks shapes before he starts a movie when he when he reads the script. And he'll come in and throw these drawings, these pictures on your desk. He goes, here's my inspiration. I want you to do whatever you do based on this thing. And so we, we, this is when we start with those garbage truck drawings, the dark phasers. And he goes, we're going to do rifles and pistols. And he goes, I want them all based on this tool. <laughs> OK, so, so we go to the, the next drawing. And there it is backwards. And so I had to make a kind of a gun out of it. So the only thing that's really reminiscent of that tool is the, the back end of it. It, 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 it. When it was forward, it looked exactly like what it was. Can we contrast and compare that? I'm sorry? Can we contrast and compare that? <coughs> yeah. And so the little grippers are what's on the back? Mm. What's that? Oh, there you go. Yeah. And we and uh, Sui Sani goes, ah, I don't care for that one too much. Let's move on. <laughs> And then he was, then he goes, do a little steampunk to it. And so that's kind of where these came from. The top one he thought was a little bit too Batman-esque, and he thought the other one was a little bit too too far in the steampunk world. And again, at this point, I don't know who who or what these things are for. They're just dark lasers. <laughs> and so uh, we move on to the next one. And then he thought these had too much color and too many weird shapes. And I actually like the one at the top, the V. Yeah. And uh, that was kind of when if I have a favorite, I put it at the top right. Ah. <laughs> that's kind of my little secret thing to that's do. And so we'll go to the next one. And this shape up on the top, he really liked. He goes, I think I like that one the most. And uh, as the course goes, we'd flatten up out the top. But that was kind of the basis for the dark enterprise weapons. And uh, he liked that little return on it. And what was funny is, uh, I, I didn't remember my handgun stuff, but that little point on the back where your thumb goes, I, I think I saw that on a gun somewhere. I, I thought it was a cool line, so I incorporated it. The way finally made the guns, that thing poked everybody in the hand. And, you know, can you get rid of that stupid knife at the back of the, <laughs> of the handle? So it was a bad, <laughs> bad drawing choice. It's called a beaver tail. <laughs> okay, we can go to the next one. And that's that's kind of the final pistol there. And uh, uh, it wound up, as the course of the movie went on, that there are so many guns in this battle that um, it didn't really matter from the side because you know in a gun battle you always see it from the front of the barrel. And as things go on, I had to like start changing the, the shape of the front more than the side. So in a battle you'd know who had <coughs> what weapon. And that uh, that started with the next gun that's coming up here pretty quick. And uh, this is the the barrage of all the dark weapon stuff. And uh, the top was kind of based on the shellaco, because you, mm. you know that the front end of it. I was kind of watching Alien. Aliens the night before, and I might make any kind of gun too. 
And so I'll present this, and they go, no, 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 we hate all of those. So, uh, so uh, that one, that, all those went away. Move the next one. And uh, they did kind of favor the Sulaco gun. Uh, I don't think we did anything at all in the end, but uh, that was that was the lovable one for a long time. Version A. We can move on. And um, at the same time this was going on, they go, we need a Gatling, a Gatling gun. And uh, it, it, it changed from being uh, the Dark Enterprise Group to basically uh, April's gun. And so this was one of the versions on it. And I found online this kind of very strange green military <coughs> rifle. And it was basically shaped like a triangle like the Superman symbol in a way. And so I, I kind of modeled this one after it, made it like a double barrel thing on the end. And uh, that was that was like for quite a while. And it's funny, you'll do these drawings, they'll like it, it goes away, and then it comes back when you least expect it. So this changes the whole thing around. That's kind of where that was going. We'll go into the next one. And uh, there you got it in the Gatling gun mode, where that uh, front end is turned around and it rotates inside of there. And that was kind of the weapons pack at the time. You had the pistol and the, and the rifle. And we can move on. And this, they come into this one, they go, we need a, a great big Gatling gun for April. There's his, his name up there. And they go, he's superhuman, and he's ripped this gun off a, I forgot the code name for the Klingon ship was. It was like a battering ram or something like that. And they go, we need the, him to draw, carry the rip off this bat, battering ram gun and yield it around with superhuman strength. So I kind of worked out the posture of how he was going to hold it first. And uh, I actually like the bottom right where he's kind of holding it on his shoulder. I thought that'd be kind of a cool comic book looking thing. But they chose the one up in the upper left as kind of the, the posture of how he'd hold this rifle. So from there, the rifle design started to come. And when we found out later what happened, if you recall in the movie, he just has these guns and he's standing in the corner. What happens is they crash a Klingon ship in there. He rips this gun off the wing, and that's what he's toting around to shoot everything with. I don't, I don't think they fully showed that in the film, what he did with it, but that's where he got that huge gun. And so we had, uh, let me go to the next one. Uh, these are just very ancient guys. Let me go to the next slide. So another version of that Gatling gun. Let me go to one more. That's kind of how it works. It was like a counter-rotating barrel. One rotates to the left and one goes to the right. And we go to the next one. Another variation on it. I thought the slide I wanted was next, sorry. <laughs> and we go to the next one. And there you go. And you've got all these, uh, you can see the ripped metal where you're supposedly going to rip it off the, off the gun. And we had all these cables hanging off of it, which the director liked. JJ thought that was pretty cool. We thought, why don't we throw it over his shoulder? Kind of like a balancing Kind of thing. So it went through a lot of fun changes, and that was a, that was a version they, they pretty much liked. So we kind of took this one a little bit further. Um, Going to go to the next frame. They needed a trigger on the top. So that's what that itty bitty button is there. Obviously, it would be controlled from somewhere else, but they needed some way for him to fire it in a practical sense. You never saw that button in the film, but that's kind of what that was for. And that was the color scheme of it there. And uh, the black and the gold were kind of the signature Klingon colors at that early time. But the Klingon world went through a very odd progress when they were designing it, because I did see some of the Klingon ships in a meeting. And they, and they they were all like, I don't know how you explain it, they were all like weird floating pyramids and, and geographical shapes and stuff that, that didn't look Klingon at all. And I'm like, what are you doing? I go, we're doing the Klingon stuff. They're, they're just like all upset. It, it, it had nothing to do Klingon-wise. It looked so bizarre, so far from what Klingons should be. Kind of came back a little bit towards the end. But. Did oh, you yeah. ask why they had a trigger on a spaceship gun? It was it was mainly for the prop guy, so he had something to push to make it rotate and stuff. Okay, it so wasn't like for yeah. So you didn't you didn't plan on the guy ripping the thing off? Yeah, so that was just one of Can you put a trigger on it? So that was the only way I could hide it without it looking like a, like a trigger. <laughs> and uh, but uh, the, and there it is. There he's holding it there. So he's got the dark rifle and the and the Gatling gun, and he supposedly had just ripped that off the off it off the ship. And they thinned thin down the cables because they had so many that kept falling off. So they took it down just one or two. How heavy do you think the prop ended up being? How much did it weigh? It was, it was pretty light. It was actually pretty light. They uh, they have all kinds of stuff. They uh, they actually grew that part, and so it was extremely extremely thin. They just put it up. They didn't go with the motor to spin the barrels in the, in the end. And, uh, so it was just basically they did it all with CG with the rotating and the fire. So basically the Gatling gun was actually the mechanism, not the, not the gun itself. 
So we'll go to the next one. And there he is swinging it. And that, I think, is the only clip you see in the back left, the new back left clip we had to do. I think it was always a blur. If I remember correctly, I don't think you ever see it not moving in the film. But he just he just beats the tar out of everybody with his gun. And uh, that was actually a really cool set. And that was actually one of the ones I was telling you about that was all angles for the longest time. And then finally, they just did this big one. So it's supposed to be Klingon Homeworld. But there's really nothing to associate it to anything that you've, you've seen before. Now we can go to the next one. Oh, just another, another battle sequence. And uh, now we're moving on to the medical props. They gave me tons and tons of these. And I was trying to uh, tie in the one from the earlier movie, but try and tie in some of the older stuff that we know from the, TN, or the uh, TOS stuff. So that's where you got the little open panel and the little silver checker inside of it. And this went through a lot of changes. So uh, it went from big to small, just all over the place. And here was the first pass of it. And uh, this is kind of what I presented with. Things and they can, I like that shape, I hate that. It works pretty good. And we can move on to the next one. There's another version that went a little bit too TNG, but they gave me that shape to use. And, and I go, I don't want to sound like I'm using the old movie as reference, but that's pretty pretty much a Captain Picard looking thing. And you go, oh, okay, then let's not show that. So that one went away. But I think first you have to do a color pass. And then we went with this one, the rolling top. And on the bottom left, you can see the uh, original version down there. Next one, and that one would be in the final piece there. So we had this little kind of, kind of little thumb guard on the bottom, and the way the the screens open up. I don't know if I ever told you my dad was a highway patrolman. His badge number was two two seven, so I always sneak his little badge number and everything. So, so I think I've been doing that for about thirty years. So you see that number? That's my dad. And we can move on. This was another medical scanner idea. I I don't recall what the first one looked like in the movie. I think it was big and white. They, would, they didn't have any pictures of it, so we, we did everything in white for medical, and that was kind of a fun idea. We'll move on to the next one. There's the final final version of the medical tricorder. And we'll go to the next one. That's the uh, both the general tricorder and the medical tricorder mixed together. And we can go on to the next one. <coughs> these are just various medical props we come up with, and they're just, these were all things that they would have had made. They're not based on anything practical. And as the movie went on, they go find something you can, that we can just add things on to. We went along. So we'll go to the next slide. This is kind of a little uh, hypospray idea that we had. And he had found this prop. I don't know what it was, but it sort of had this shape. And so uh, it was something he just needed to just kind of detail as opposed to build from scratch. And so we came up with this thing. And this is actually where they would, they were starting to talk about testing April's blood or Cobb's blood. And so you check, check the, you could check the hypospray and the blood on it. So we could move on to the next one. More variations on it. And we go to the next one. More variations of her. Spend most of the day drawing these sketches till uh, till they pick something they like. So uh, it's actually a pretty quick, easy way to go. And we can go to the next one. And this was the first idea where we had blood, blood checker. That was, they wanted a piece that pulled out in the original thing. So they go take it out and check it a little bit more action for the for the dramatics. We go to the next one. Another medical scanner. And that was my little homage to Blade Runner with the eyeball in the background. <laughs> but this is kind of the medical medical pack here. A little bit of everything you got. So that's a that's a bonus thing. And um, this was another a gun we had come with uh, come up at the end. And we used this place called ISS Props. Uh, depending on the show, they exclusively want you to use it, or once in a while they'll let us use a can. Uh, but it's kind of tough if, if uh, ISS can't handle the prop load. I think they met Ken on, on Star Trek doing the, the props for it. But this one was something they had in the back, and we just kind of built it to match what we were going with with the colors and stuff. And I don't even think you see that yet, actually, ever. <laughs> and so we go to the next one. They wanted to modify the, the phaser a little bit, uh, again, for a toy reason. And so we did this whole pop up piece with a kind of a sensor in it that they could adjust the settings. And that, I don't think it went anywhere, but uh, that's the way it goes. Let me go to the next one. And this was the first passes at the at the Starfleet rifles. And this one also had a code name, and I can't remember what it was at the time. But they wanted a gargantuan scope on top. Of this. They came in. We want a huge scope on whatever the the Starfleet rifle is going to look like. And um, it was it was just obnoxious, and it was kind of looking a little bit too present day as opposed to Star Starfleet kind of stuff. But uh, that was what they were asking for. So there were the first passes on it. <coughs> and uh, we can go to the next one. It's, it's 
it's starting to phase down a little bit. The scope's getting a little bit smaller, so they did they did start pulling back on that. And this is kind of roughly based on a, a, a kind of a rifle I saw on, online that had a, a pull-out uh, rifle stock on it. So you got kind of the short firing gun, and then the more of that accurate sniper style. And uh, at that time, the color scheme was going to be the silver with this deep black, kind of giving it a two-tone look. And and uh, we were doing the same with the little hand phaser. It kind of it's kind of a neat look for it. Opposed with the solid chrome, with the kind of the aged metal on top, so it's kind of fun. And we go to the next one. This is getting a little bit closer to the final. It's still still not with quite what they went for, and I hated all these, so I was really glad they kept wanting to see other things. So we can move on to the next one, and that's just a variation on that that bottom drawing we just saw. And we go to the next one, and that one right there wound up being the uh, pretty close to the final drawing there. We got a little scope, and it pops down, so it kind of has a little. Uh, Automation going on at the back slides out again for the sniper versus the kind of the scatter gun kind of treatment. And we can go to the next line. And at one point they came in and they go, for action shake, we want this thing to discard shells like a machine gun. And it's like, oh no, not, not a machine gun with shells coming out of it. So we're trying to think of the, the hardest way how to kind of tie in Star Trek in the future with this request. So I came up with this little rotating cylinder where it doesn't necessarily eject a cartridge, but the light drops when it's empty and it rotates to a new, <coughs> a new uh, so you got basically four power cells in there. And uh, and uh, you got a little window on the side, so when that light fades <coughs> around, you can see the mechanism rotated in it, just to show kind of that mechanism working. And we go to the next one, and it faded out. They wound up not doing it, but it was a big, a big issue for many weeks to have to do that thing. And what is here, the bottom is the actual prop, and then the drawings of it are above it. And uh, uh, at the last minute, they changed that scheme because the dark enterprise had the dark weapon. So uh, they wanted to go completely color different. So it went just to the, uh, the two-tone silver to the bottom version. But it was kind of fun to see how that translated out from the, from the drawing to the, the real piece. And we go to the next one. And there you got a gentleman holding it. And we go to the next one. And there's the silver rifle there. And it was kind of neat. I didn't draw a front view of it. But when they came back with that really pointy tip, it was really a cool looking additive on there. So I kind of like the way that rifle looked. And it felt really good in your hand, too. Unlike the earlier stuff, was really goofy. But that one felt pretty good. OK, go to the next one. Uh, these are some more uh, dark phaser ideas. And we go to the next one. And this is the Kenormian gun. So, uh, I don't know if they explained this very well in the movie, but they, uh, they have the Kenorian shuttle, and they were disguising so they could sneak into Klingon space to take care of Khan, capture Khan. And so they had sort of looked like they weren't Starfleet. They got the uh, Kenorian's guns as well. And this is the one where we really had to distinguish that barrel. And um, I think Man of Steel was just getting ready to come out at the time, or they're working on it. And I thought, let's do the front of the barrel. It looked like the Superman symbol. And so, uh, I think the next one might show it a little bit better. Next slide. Oh, well, that was the that was the one they approved. And we go to the next one. And there you go. That very front top is like a double Superman symbol, <laughs> upright, <laughs> downright. So, so it really looked really distinguishing when they aimed it at you. And that was the color tone they wanted a wood handle. And uh, someone brought up, why don't you make it a clear amber handle? <laughs> oh, that's already been done a little bit better. <laughs> so, uh, like the Blade Runner gun. But we can move on to the next one. And there you got uh, Kirk's got one. And that was actually one of the ones that Ken Alpro made. So I think he might have some pictures of that to show you later. And we go to the next set. And um, this uh, was a very interesting uh, deal. They weren't sure what they wanted to do, but it had to do with a portable transporter that we had to come up with. And the, the, the idea was that he sneaks on, steals this particular piece out of their transporter of the Enterprise. And use it or, uh, somewhere on what some ship he stole one, stole this piece and created a portable transporter out of it. And I guess Khan was quite the uh, intellect, so he could take these things and invent uh, whatever he wanted to. And so this was the first phase on that transporter device. <coughs> and actually, the bottom drawing, I, I, they needed something for a meeting, and that's actually one of the things from Iron Man 2 from the suitcase. <laughs> they took the suitcase away and just threw that on there for an idea. Luckily, yeah, they didn't take it. <laughs> so we can go to the next one. And these are a whole bunch of variety of these pieces. And the way it was going to sit was it was going to sit on either side of the 
the seat in the, the little fighter ship that Khan is in when he's firing at all the uh, Starfleet uh, heads. And so these were all little ideas. None of these seemed to make anybody happy. So we moved on to the next one. Uh, they didn't care for any of these. Actually, the top one was a, a rejected uh, medical tricorder. I just threw it on the side. And it had a fun shape. And we go to the next one. And this is kind of the first one they started liking. It's kind of a, a, a three-part kit. And so you got the little uh, activation box, which is on the bottom, bottom in the middle, and then two pieces would be left and right transported, the center and receiver piece. And uh, so they're stuck on there. They kind of look like speakers on the seat, so that kind of acts, acts that look. They go, well, I always going to think they're speakers. So we got rid of those. We go to the next one. And uh, we were just fighting and fighting with, with what to do with this thing. And, and we're working late, and the janitor came in. He had yeah. this vacuum on his back. He's <laughs> vacuuming away. And I go, and me and my prop guy looking, I go, that's got to be the piece. So he took, took his vacuum. And we ran over to JJ's office. We said, what do you think of this? He goes, that's great. And so uh, we, uh, we had a, must have had that thing for an hour. And then we come back to the janitor. I gotta go. <laughs> so we gave back his thing and found this thing, and so we can move on to the next picture. Oh, that was out of order, but uh, that was another idea on that that transporter device. So we'll go to the next one, and there you go. There's the vacuum. And uh, it was it was another weird job because we weren't supposed to see it in this form. We we're supposed to see it only burnt in the wreckage, but we had to get to this stage so we knew what to turn it into when it was burnt. And so uh, those are the activating devices, the two rods. They wanted a cable feed to it and uh, an activator. And that's kind of the rough layout. They pretty much like that one. So we go to the next one. There's the color version. And then they go, OK, we love it now. Now burn it. So we have to go to the burning drawings next. And there's what you got. The bottom was too much. They couldn't hold that. They thought it would be too fragile. And the one in the middle there was about, about just right. And so we went with that one. And that's what Scotty holds up. Hey, look what we found in the wreck. And that's all you get of it. And uh, there's a long part where we're drawing triple cages. It's never, I, I think it wanted to be in a little background scene, but those were some ideas for the, the little baby triples. They're having trail. <laughs> so there you go. That's them. <coughs> and this is, uh, this is the beginning of the, the volcano bomb. And I think this is what we spent the most time on, was drawing this bomb to freeze the volcano on the, on the uh, primitive alien world. And so, uh, uh, they came in and they go, we have this case, what can you do with it? And it was a pelican case, so I doctored it up a little bit. But the, the, the sequence of the bomb was, uh, you got the bomb and the activator. And uh, when he opens it up, he drops it and it's broken. So we're trying to figure out what would break that thing if you drop it, because it would probably be pretty, pretty sound in there. So that itty bitty screw on the left is what breaks everything. So when he drops it, that's supposed to run around and break all the glass and ruin it. And so uh, they kind of liked that idea for a while. So we moved to the, the next picture. And I don't know where this came from. I think someone <coughs> watched one of the old Star Trek episodes. They go, what do you say we use the tricorder to bypass the broken parts? So that, we started doing that. We broke down the tricorder on what parts you can do it. And they were really big on using cabling. So uh, nothing was remote like we know Star Trek would kind of be. So the cabling kind of just ties in the story that, hey, you had to tie this in to make it work. So we go to the next one. There's the bomb, the activator, and that's the whole process of how that would activate. And that's the uh, the freezing bomb there in the center and how you'd access it. So we go to the next one. And there's the entire sequence from broken to activated and manipulated. And there it goes. And the last minute they go, we have another box. So they pull out the, I think it's a cowboy hat box, you might think. And so they brought this box and they go, let's see what this looks like. And JJ <laughs> immediately liked that box better. So I'm trying to figure out the confirmation or the configuration of how that was all going to work with the same setup. They got a couple more versions of how it was going to work. And uh, well, you might we go back just one yeah. more? And uh, I think I have a color one coming up later, but that was basically how that volcano bomb was going to work. So it opens it up, works it. And uh, as they film this thing, you know, it's kind of ethereal. You see it a little bit and you don't see it. But um, it's kind of fun, all that hard work you put into things, and you see the final piece, and then uh, you just kind of see how it winds up on the screen. And <coughs> you don't see it. <laughs> but uh, it was pretty fun. OK, next one. And they came in, and, and they didn't even know how to uh, pronounce it. They go, what are those baklava things they <laughs> I go, oh, no. And I kind of point. I tried really hard not to say anything correct. I, had, I kind of played 
silly and a lot of stuff just so they wouldn't go, you know this movie too much, you gotta get out of here. But uh, I, know, I know what you mean. And so we started drawing these out. And the bottom one was as close to the traditional backlit or the backlit as possible. And um, I go, this is kind of what they have. And I go, here's where we can go. So I did like a sort of collis, kind of the second one down. And, and uh, that bottom, the one, the, the third one down was, was kind of my favorite. So we, we went from there to the next slide. And uh, that was the shape they kind of went with. So that's what it, what it looks like. And we made one out of cardboard. And there was no way you could spin that without it hitting you. I thought, my, you're going to cut your arm off, your leg, your head, free. You did that. It, you worked with uh, the Klingon actors to have them do it too. <coughs> and then in, in the end, after all that work, they just swing it. So it was kind of, <laughs> kind of fun. But that was the final one. And it was it uh, has a little bit of the reminiscent of the old backlit, but with a little bit new. And, uh, they aren't kind of big on the retro thing because obviously the old world doesn't exist anymore, but that's where that went. So we go to the next one. And uh, somewhere in the middle they wanted throwing stars. And it was another, we have 10 minutes to get stuff ready for a meeting. So these are actually all shapes from uh, G.I. Joe, the first one, the Cobra. So I threw those on there and I wanted me, I forgot that uh, the prop assistant's name was Melissa and she was on G.I. Joe. She goes, I know all these shapes. I go, well, you need some for a quick meeting, so there you go. So they needed all those. So we go to the next one. And this is what it turned out to be. And they let me use the Klingon symbol, which I thought was going to be booted immediately. They go, hey, that's pretty cool. And I go, that's the original symbol, in a way. And they go, well, we don't mind that. So that kind of went through. And that's the that's the actual throwing star that they, they built. Again, it's just a blur. You don't see it in the movie. But they were heavy. They were really pretty cool. Do you so. think that, uh, with the change in director, there'll be any change in towards uh, he was asking if the change of the director for the new one might change the director. Well, the, the, he was on the first two movies, so I think that vein might go the same. I'm not, I'm not sure. So it's his first time directing too. So it'll be interesting to see. One of the writers got the directing for the new Star Trek movie. Uh, uh, Orgy, I think, uh, got it. So that's that. So we can move on. They want to click on knives. These are all based kind of roughly on, on scuba knives. Mm -hmm. and for the Klingon, this new Klingon architecture, I had to do the same thing I did with the primitive world. What, what's going to tie this into Klingon? So this little kind of uh, repeated Sydney Opera House kind of jagged piece was going to be the new Klingon kind of architecture that kind of tied it into their weapons. So you'll kind of see that progress through the rest of the, their, their weapons. So we'll go to the next one. This was the very first pass. I was trying to trying to pay a little homage to the older guns, and but add a little kind of pirate look to the, the stuff. And um, these were quickly all thrown out the window and I took them hard. Oh, gosh, no. But we do like the the, the little uh, bayonet on the front. I think I was already that managed to go through. So we'll go to the next one. This is a rough version of both a rifle and a pistol. And so they liked the jaggedness, but uh, they were too jagged. As I was saying earlier, the architecture at that point, Everything was these extremely jagged, goofy angles. It doesn't make, make any sense. Everything hurt. You know, older to work with it. And so that was the first pass. It's slowly smoothed out as the as the show went on. So we go to the next one. Another variation on it. And uh, that was actually my favorite rifle. That kind of configuration kind of fit your hip really good. So we go to the next one. And uh, do a little bit of kind of color pass on it. I find sometimes that um, they like the pencil sketches, but if I don't throw a, a grayscale or a color on it, they'll pass over it. And uh, if I add a little color, they, they, they look a little longer. And so that's kind of where these color patterns are starting to come in. So we'll go to the next one. And that one will be in the, the, <coughs> final, the final two. And uh, the pistol, I, I always love that old uh, original series version. As close as and as many kind of angles as the old gun uh, it was, I tried to put those in there. So that's uh, as close as I can get to the old one and still get it through. And uh, that one at the end, the two, they have the uh, they both have a double knife on the front. This view you can only see one. I think I have the next the next shot might have that view. Yeah, there you go. See, so you got the, the double blades. And I think the next shot actually has the actual prop in it. Oh, that's the that's basically the click on pack. So once everything gets approved, we do a, a drawing where everything is, is in there. So those are the knives, the short, the long, the two sizes of the stars, uh, the pistol, the rifle, and, and the back one. We go on to the next one. And there you got a Hura using it. That girl is so funny. I love talking to her. <laughs> she's a, she smokes about 
never puts it down. <laughs> Great. <laughs> the smoking Klingon. So we can go on to the next one. There she is again. And uh, she was good. She must she must have had some shooting background. She always knew what to do. Uh, unlike if you watch the TNG movies, they're always <laughs> going for the visual, visual effects guy to make the beam go where it's supposed to go. Uh, that I'll shoot their feet off. <laughs> go, go to the next one. There's the gang all settled in there. And uh, it was funny, this was the, a big, we filmed at Sony instead of Paramount because the Sony studios were closer to Bad Robot Productions. And they had this huge stage there and they just finished uh, filming uh, uh, the last Batman movie. Not uh, the uh, the last one that uh, Nolan did. And so this was the Batcave set. They had, uh, <laughs> the Batcave, the, it was the biggest Batcave I think I'd ever seen. And uh, so we went in there and it was like, a, I don't know how high the ceilings were, but they, uh, they built the set floor to ceiling every inch of the space. So. It was a vast, vast set. And all those parts back there, if you if you old aviation guy, those I went to an old place called uh, Thompson Aviation and, and it's just a giant airplane graveyard. We just bought tons and tons of these old airplane parts. I think those are old engine engine cylinders and stuff, so it's got this kind of and they had good luck to them. They didn't paint them, they just look great. Okay, you the next one? This is the uh, this is that uh, warp core at the end. And uh, they ran in, they go, hey, we got these shapes and we got this warp core and it's out of alignment. And uh, so we need you to kind of detail the parts off. So uh, they were big into the, uh, the uh, I, we found pictures, we don't know what they were called, they were, they were these silver medical things, they have these cylinders all over them. And uh, so we kind of based that roughly on those those deals. So here's kind of the rough layout. And go to the next one. There's kind of two views of it. And so the one on the right is the one I was talking about with all those weird little cylinders, canister cylinders popping off of it. And uh, the one on the left is the other version. I think they went more with the canister version in the, in the final scene. And uh, we didn't know what the background was going to look, look like, so I put the, uh, the inside of the, the wind tunnel on the Bespin station as the, the background. The little Star Wars in there. Can we go to the next one? And uh, this is the world famous Budweiser plant. <laughs> the ship runs on beer, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I don't know why they kept using that Budweiser plant because it's just, it's just it, you know what it is. But uh, it's it, was, it was pretty cool to go through there. They had drawn in the original movie; they had drawn some beautiful engine rooms. They were fantastic, and uh, they didn't have the budget for any of them, even for optically doing it. <coughs> so that's why they did the Bud plant. They were originally going to use it for the hallways and optically put different walls and stuff in. And they go, oh, that looks cool. Let's go with it. It, it didn't look good. <laughs> So, but this was just some device they needed at the end. And uh, so that was just a, a rough rough piece that we had to put in at the end. So they built that practically and stuck it there. And this was kind of fun. Our, our set decorator, she ran over and she goes, I need a list of models. They're going to show models in uh, the commander's office. I go, oh, cool. She goes, what models would we would we do that like show the history of flight to President Star Trek? So. Uh, started with some of the early aviation stuff. So I go, you can get all of these as desktop models. And uh, it was funny because I go, and she goes, well, what do I do about the Star Trek models? I go, let's call the Wonderfest guys and let them build these things and let them keep it at the end and you won't have to pay anything. I'm sure 50 guys would be happy to make these models if you, they could keep it after you're done filming. And she was all excited about it. So I was going to send from the, uh, I guess, number 17 down. We we're going to try and send everything over, over this way. Now the quantum mechanics guy was in there and overheard the conversation. He goes, we'll do it for you for free. That's a great idea. So they did it and they kept everything. <laughs> so so that, that's how that kind of went. But, uh, it, it, for a while there, it was going to be a, a cool Wonderfest thing. But it didn't work out. And so those are the models they used, or the list of them anyway. <laughs> and that was my first view of the Black Enterprise. When uh, I go, I need to see what it looks like for the model's sake. And, uh, that was the first time I got to see it. So we go to the next one. And there's the cast and crew on Hollywood Boulevard. And they built this big set down there for the premiere. And as you can see, JJ is the shortest guy of the whole cast. And I don't know what it is, but he cast huge, huge actors and actresses. On the bridge, there was no one shorter than probably six foot one. I mean, everybody. And they're just all giant people. It was so cool to see. And they had this crazy character, a bald guy with a clock in the back of his head. I don't know what it was. It was a cool spank. I don't even think you saw it in the film. But you walk by and go, hey, what time is it? I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> 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 you know. <laughs> or what time do you think it is? <laughs> okay, we go to the next one. And this is just other stuff, so I think we're kind of done with that. Uh, 
Star Trek days. And um, but that's uh, again, yeah, that's kind of the, these kind of poster prints I've been working on on the side. So that previous, if you don't mind going back one more, let's get some. This kind of I do these for the for the calendar, but um, what what they let me do is carry on with the Enterprise E designs that we never got to do for the movie, and this is actually kind of a scene. Um, this was going to take place in Nemesis, and what we were going to do with Nemesis in the in the uh, Raymond Ward with the, the Scorpion fighters. This was going to be uh, Starfleet's version of what would counterattack those Scorpion fights. It was going to be a big battle, and they wound up not ever pursuing it. It was going to be a budgetary thing. But that was kind of be uh, the shuttle bay and what the, the fighters were going to be. It was just rough sketches at the time, but the calendar kind of let me pursue it a little bit further. And so we go to the next one. <coughs> and that was kind of a rough fighter at the time. And I kind of carried that onto JJ's Enterprise for a while. They were going to have a Mac shuttle. And so I took it to JJ's world for a while because it got kicked out of TNG. But um, that was kind of going to be what the fighter is. And it's named after McCall, Robert McCall, the space artist. And, uh, uh, he was kind of a buddy, and when he passed away, I wanted to kind of name something Star Trek out of him. He was a big Star Trek fan and worked on the motion picture, so that was kind of in honor of him. And we we'll go to the next one. And anyone from Arizona, Phoenix, Arizona? Here? Okay. Well, that one, uh, I was trying to sneak funny things in there. There's a TV show I grew up called Wallace and Lab on, so I named that one after the Wallace. And we go to the next one. And then uh, that calendar page let me open up the bottom bay, which we never got a chance to do. And we go to the next one. And uh, I don't know if you saw this. This was the uh, uh, genesis of the Enterprise E from, from all the movies. And the bottom is the, the very first approved sketch. And the one of it is based on uh, the model and, and, and Rick's plans. Rick never drew the nacelles. And the, or the, and the struts. He only kind of did the body and the saucer and ILM kind of filled in the gap. And uh, it went a little bit flat on the top. I think I can show you that. So I had this kind of graceful curve right here, and it went away in the model. It kind of went flat and then dropped down. And that, uh, that one kind of design part always kind of bothered me. And the same with the bottom where the diameter slope is going, and it, it stops as opposed to kind of curving under. And when uh, uh, insurrection came up. Uh, we go, hey, we're doing a CG. If you want to make any changes, so I did a little bit, but it could still kind of look the same. Um, they Santa Barbara was the effects house that did the effects, and they're more. They did a lot of stuff on Star Trek, but their backgrounds, their planets, and and uh, nebulas and stuff. And so ships were really a new thing for them. And uh, they go, we can't really do what, what you're asking. So if you don't mind, we're just going to scan the model and go from there. So that's kind of where that stood. And for Nemesis, they kind of let me do those, those changes, and they were right on the verge of where they were going to go. And uh, Nemesis, for the longest time, was not going to be the last TNG movie. And uh, somewhere about two thirds in the way, we started seeing them tearing the sets down and destroying them. We were thinking something's not right. And that's when all the budget changes and all the, all the uh, sequences were getting cut out. They were just saying, we're happy with what we got, we don't want to add any more. And so the final scene, when the Enterprise E is in the dry dock, they were going to do the Aztec paint job. We're going to like make a whole new kind of Enterprise E version of it. And that top view is going to be the final, the final profile of it. So it, it's it's subtle, but there's a whole lot of differences on there from from the motion or from uh, first contact, uh, the final Nemesis scene. So that was kind of the genesis of that ship. And the two little, the, right in the center, you see the the. Uh, uh, on the left, you got the, the filming miniature, and on the right, you got the uh, the Nemesis CG model. So it was uh, kind of fun to see that in comparison. Can we go to the next one, and that's kind of what the that's a little bit on the, on the high contrast end, but that was a, a, a rough layout of what the Aztec paneling was going to look on it. And uh, we go to the next one. And just the that was, that's just a Photoshop mess around. I took the old first contact drawing into Photoshop, so I was practicing. Go to the next one, and uh, those are from the uh, online game. But ten years ago, when another company owned it, and um, these are actually rough ideas that we had done for the TV show for uh, uh, Enterprise, but they were all shapes that were too far out. And obviously, this has been modified to be more TNG era, but they all kind of had their roots back in the TNG days. Go to the next one. And uh, that, I read about that one because it was fun. That was my actual very first Star Trek drawing for Star Trek V. And I uh, was in the model shop, and they go, hey, we need to 
do this Klingon gun, and we had a really bad picture of the ILM model, so I kind of took their bad photo that they gave us and kind of came up with that. So that was my, my first Star Trek drawing. It was kind of fun. And uh, I'd never heard of markers before you got them, and so a guy walks in and I go, hey, I have a great marker. So it was, it was pretty fun. Fun, fun old times. That was uh, 88 or 89, somewhere back then. Okay, go to the next one. And uh, I think from there it's just the stuff you've already seen, so I think we can cancel that out. Are we good to the time we got over there? Actually, let's see. 1148? Yes, perfect. Okay, very good. Very good then. Stick around. Okay, good. All right, I guess I can wrap the Star Trek stuff out there and. Uh, Answer any questions you have, but uh, oh yeah, I'll show you this. If you uh, um, this is for the uh, the Star Trek Renegade show, they called up and asked if I could do a Klingon ship for them. So uh, I do these drawings, and uh, if you're familiar with Tobias Richter's work, he did the 3D model on it. Just just fantastic work that guy does. So I just sent him these roughs over, and, and he made it. And I, even, I I think they're on the verge of presenting that movie, if I'm not mistaken. Scott Nakata and a bunch of other guys have been making their own kind of computer online uh, structure. <laughs> it's been pretty fun to watch them do it, but uh, they call it, let me do a shift, and I was excited. But I kind of base that, I think if you go back one slide, I think that's probably why I had that up. But this is uh, when we started doing the TV show Enterprise, the very first or second episode we had a, had a Klingon ship, so I retroed the old Matt Jeffries ship, and uh, we went to this extent, they built the model, and they were doing CG work, doing the shots and stuff, and one of the producers came and goes, oh, I hate that thing. And so they threw it away. And, but um, uh, I carried that cabling on to the later Klingon ships. I kind of was looking at Russian architecture and everything. At this one point had these cablings. Now that'd be kind of cool to carry over to the Klingon architectural world. So I had these cables on it, and the later Klingon ships that like, carried that cabling on, even though this one didn't make it. But I like that shape, and so what Scott called out, uh, asked for that uh, Renegades Klingon ship. I carried a lot of the points or got rid of the cabling, but kept the points on it. So I'm going to go to that, that next one again. So it's reminiscent, but a little bit further into the, the jaggedy world. So that was pretty fun. It, it was always great to let Tobias take his, his time and build something fun. That was good news. Okay, and that's it. All right. Well, there's, a, there's a great path. Oh. The pinup girls for Star Wars. This Hurry is a, a very interesting thing. I'll tell you about this. Uh, I was working for a gallery that uh, has a Star Wars license, and um, uh, they go, "What would you want to do for Star Wars stuff for the thir uh, 30th anniversary?" And uh, I go, "What do you say we do some nose art?" And so I did this Princess Leia thing, and, and Lucas really liked it. So we kind of carried it for a while, and he goes, "Let's do some more stuff." And I'm doing all these for the A wing and the B wing and the X wing and all this stuff, and they're going to do like these nose art pieces. And when Disney bought Star Wars, we got a note back. Oh, we don't want to be associated with that kind of stuff. And it wasn't the pinup that they they minded, but that it was nose art. And the, Disney's really big on eliminating their World War II history. Oh. And so uh, they have all these books because most of Disney in the 40s did nose art. Right. Like an entire yep. division was nose art only. And they put out these beautiful books and DVDs, and they start pull, they started pulling them as they went out. And they go, we don't want to have that association with Disney anymore. So they felt that this carried into that World War II era. So they, so they pulled them for that. So it's kind of interesting backstory on it. And that's it. Totally cool. Anyways, any questions? Oh, this was a great, another great one. <laughs> <laughs> Here's what's going on. We got another panel in about 40 minutes that John is on. Uh, he's going to be joined by Ken Palco as well as Carol Bell. Uh, and he's agreed to stick around and fill the time in between. Is that cool? Oh, sure, sure. So if anybody has any Star Trek questions, you want that. But this was fun because uh, Jamie over at uh, Round 2 Models calls up and goes, hey, we're redoing the Enterprise. Do you want to do the box art? And uh, I mentioned one time I always wanted to do model box art. So he, he gave me this project to do. And so that's the one on the new new box they got over there. And, uh, and uh, he goes, we do the background, so you just do the ship. And so that was kind of fun. I guess they have a, a format for that kind of blue spacey background. But that was great, great fun to do. And I don't think I'd visited the, the first contact enterprise in a long time. So that was kind of fun. I had to go back and look at the photos to remember what wasn't added later. But uh, there it was, and that was a lot of fun. 
that's the end. All right. All right. End of the show.